for a sec, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, we are uh, at the usual, our usual starting time, 12.07. Uh, so, uh, so it's gonna be a little uh, complicated um, handoffs going on here, but it'll start with Herman. Uh, move to Yang and go back to Herman. Uh, so Herman, um, take it away. Okay, um, Vinay, I hope that um, you'll be able to keep track of the uh, participant window uh, while I, you know, take over my screen with my uh, presentation so that you can look to see if people raise hands or uh, uh, raise questions in the chat window or something. Yes, uh, I will keep an eye on I, that. Yeah, you can. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the people are uh, free to sort of chime in uh, by unmuting themselves. It's, uh, it's essentially free for all. We have never yeah, been sure. so mobbed. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, yeah, just, um, you know, just in case that there's other stuff going on. The, yeah. These windows tend to get hidden during Zoom when you're getting yeah. you talk. So, yeah. um, okay, so I'm uh, going to pull up my screen. Um, this one. Okay, you got that right? Yeah, we can see. And um, uh, screen sharing and it's full screen for me. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. So um, I'm gonna talk about uh, concordance. This is a calibration problem that we want, that we raised uh, with Shaoli um, uh, and, uh, and everyone else here. Um, uh, five years ago, we were trying to understand uh, how to uh, best uh, bring everyone into agreement uh, uh, when measuring uh, sources. So um, what we mean by that is that we have a problem that we have discrepant results from different uh, observatories. Um, Besides the temperatures, most of these uh, discrepancies come in the way of measuring a flux, the, uh, the rate of um, photons coming in per second per, per unit area of the instrument. Um, and we've measured uh, many different sources where we can see such problems that one instrument will measure one flux and another instrument measuring the same source will get a different answer. Uh, we've done it with clusters, with uh, blazars, which are active galaxies, and they vary quite a bit, so you use simultaneous observations to do that. Um, and then also supernova remnants, uh, which are static, mostly, so that you should be able to measure the emission lines from the supernova remnant and compare them. And yet, um, quite frequently, we still have um, uh, disagreements in what those fluxes are giving us. So, I'm going to, um, we're going to have some math. Um, and um, one of the things I want to define is what the flux is for uh, that a, an instrument would derive. So we have um, a, a, an index I, which will indicate an instrument, and an index J, which will in, indicate a source, uh, source J out of so many. Uh, and so if an, a given instrument measures a flux, um, they will, it will be unique to that instrument because we do not actually have uh, agreement on uh, uh, all the instruments. And the effective areas of the instruments, particularly the AI, the little AI, are, are estimates of where the effective areas are before we launch our instrument, um, are um, subject to uh, imperfect uh, ground calibration. And once we get our instruments into orbit, because we're dealing with x-rays, we have to be above the atmosphere, um, the instrument's performance can actually change. Things can shift. Uh, you can have contamination. There are a number of things that can happen. Or you just didn't, well, maybe. Okay, so uh, we have, we're going to define uh, what we call priors, which is our, in our best guess, in each individual project's estimate as to what their effective area of their system is. And these may differ, uh, will, will differ, and this is what we want to understand is, is what the true values are or a better estimate of the effective areas with the capital A, little a being a measured quantity versus a, um, um, a, a, a sort of true quantity. So uh, the, another of the problems is that we don't have absolute calibrators. We do not have sources in the sky that are constant in time and um, effective for many different band passes. 
I was going to bring up one case um, at some point uh, that it used to be that the Crab Nebula was the calibration source. Everybody used it, but that was in prehistory. Now we know that the Crab Nebula actually varies. Uh, it's also extended. It makes it really hard uh, to do, use it for cross calibration, and it's and it and it's um, and its uh, spectrum isn't exactly well known. So we do not have absolute calibrators in flight. Um, so there is no, there is no true uh, flux of a source uh, for each individual source for which we measure the um, uh, an instrument's version of that. And you'll note that the exposure time and the uh, you know comes into this. So what we want is to derive a, a, an estimate for what these true values are in order to get optimal agreement for all the instruments. So we have a, um, I have a graph, graphic version, let me see. Oh yeah, some examples of what we've done in cross calibration so far. On the left, upper left here, we have an early um, uh, paper. These are all um, uh, a product of the IACEC, which is the International Astronomical Consortium of High Energy calibrator, uh, Calibration, for High Energy Calibration, which is a group of uh, calibration scientists around the world you're working on different X-ray telescopes. And so we get together on a regular basis uh, and compare our results. So here, for example, in this upper left one for a supernova remnant, uh, it was observed by uh, looks like um, seven, eight, eight different instruments. Uh, and they all get different answers for the flux vertically here. So horizontally, that, that's just an arbitrary thing. It just says, you know, um, everyone, all these different instruments that are uh, being used. One is Chandra here. ACES was a Chandra instrument. Uh, there are three XMM instruments and there are three, uh, four from, uh, three from Susaku and one from the Swift X-ray telescope. And uh, the fluxes are different. Also, if that, that's just for the soft band and the hard band, the fluxes are also different. And you can see the differences can be uh, easily 10, 10 to 20%. 10 to 20% seems really annoying for, uh, for people. And it actually uh, hinders our ability to do uh, some research where we actually need to know uh, measurements to of order a few percent. Uh, people who measure the Hubble constant, for instance, want to know that. And that, that uh, Hubble constant gives you an estimate of the age of the universe and the size of the universe and things like that. So another one that um, uh, Christine led, uh, you know, she's on the call here. This is an active galaxy observed by several objects, uh, several uh, telescopes simultaneously. And here we have the um, uh, measurements as a function of energy in different band passes. Uh, by different instruments. And uh, you can see one instrument is consistently low, another instrument is consistently high, but it's a function of energy. So uh, we want to be able to bring all of these into agreement um, and find we need a tool to be able to do that. Um, an, you know, another example is you can look at very broad band passes to quantify uh, how different the uh, fluxes are. And once you set the uh, spectral index to them uh, uh, to be the same for all of them, you get different instruments having different fluxes. And this is just not, not a healthy situation to be in. On the right, we have uh, the supernova remnant, um, EO102, and the, the, the little vertical bands, the vertical co the colors indicate different uh, wavelengths of lines in the supernova remnant. And uh, the you know, horizontally, we have different um, uh, different instruments. So, thirteen different instruments were you know, involved in this study, uh, done by uh, 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 published by Paul Plachinski a, a couple of years back. And what you're looking at is just the uh, ratio of the fluxes measured in those bands relative to that of some standard, which is relatively arbitrary. It was just it was made up at some point saying, here's what, here's our, here's our standard model of the, of the, um, of the fluxes in these different lines. And then everyone measures relative to that standard model. And that's one reason, uh, one of the benefits of the IACEC is that uh, we can, as a team, agree on what that standard model is. 
Okay, so these are some examples and the, the, the literature is full of uh, uh, different cases that are done by individual scientists and these are all done by the actual calibration scientist team. So we recognize as, as calibration scientists that there are issues that we have to go fix. All right, so um, schematically one, one might imagine the process by which you want to um, correct your instrument in such a fashion as this. And imagine you have uh, three different sources and three different um, uh, telescopes. Okay, the flux, uh, the, there are true fluxes, the capital F values measured by, um, or that are intrinsic to the source. Okay, and then we have um, the, uh, the, what, the, what should be the true count rate um, or the true effective area for an instrument. And they would all agree if, you know, when they, when they measure a given count rate, they should all agree if, that, if the area were, um, if these areas were correct, they should all give the same fluxes. But instead, with the prior values of, a, of the effective areas, uh, the, the fluxes that are estimated are, are, are deviant, uh, that they, will, they do not get the same answers. Okay, so this um, instrument one has a prior version of its, uh, of its effective area, which is um, smaller than what its, what its true flux, uh, true effective area should be, and therefore it gets a, a higher flux. And it's, well, what we want to do is find out what that better version of the effective area should be to bring the effective area, to bring the flux down and have it uh, come into agreement with the other instruments. Now, in reality, of course, we do not have any one instrument that knows what the answer is. I show one case here where it happens to be uh, correct, but we do not know which instrument that, that could be. In this case, it's the one with the smallest effective area. Um, the one with the largest effective area in this case, you know, this just a you know schematic, um, is is actually um, un underestimating its effective area. Its, uh, uh, effective area should be uh, higher and give a higher flux. I'm oh, sorry, it should be lower to give a higher flux. Okay. Anyway, that's just a schematic problem. How do we get many diff uh, different measurements? with count rates and, and exposure times in different instruments. So clearly there are ways to do this badly. So um, we found it useful to, um, to just go through the little you know, exercise and say, well, what do we do if we don't have good statisticians working with this in this? Again, we have fluxes that are measured by each individual instrument. And one could imagine that we'll just go through and we'll say, we're just gonna take the average flux um, and we'll take some average somehow, which will involve some statistical weighting, let's say, and we'll all reference to that, um, to, that uh, uh, to that flux, okay? So we would try to estimate a new value of our effective area, which is just the count rates that we measure in our instrument, divided by the exposure time and this standard flux that we take as the average. Well, this is not very good statistically statistical method, but it has worse problems than that. In that, um, if we use statistical weighting to make this average, which one might think to do ahead of time, saying, "Hey, more photons is, are better," um, then the answer actually depends upon your effective on the actual effective areas you have in your instrument. The ones that have the most effective area will dominate the uh, the uh, uh, the measurements or the ones with the longest exposure times that get the most photons. And that means that you can design your instrument to essentially dominate the, the uh, calculation of what the average uh, flux might be. Uh, and that makes for uh, experiment dependent uh, results, which is not a healthy way to go about uh, 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 um, setting up your situation. If you don't do any weighting at all, it's agnostic, but it's not a stable situation because any given instrument can just increase their exposure time and that'll change their, the weighting uh, being provided and that'll change the estimates of the flux. So that's, this is not a, not a good way to do things. You could just decide that one of the instruments is correct um, and just set the um, flux arbitrarily to that measured by that one instrument or you know, 
say it's instrument five, and you just pick that one. Then, of course, it's all subjective. Which one is the instrument to use? And we all, all of our calibration scientists, believe we know something about our calibrations and think our, so our calibrations are good. And so we still have a, um, we have a problem that it's still subjective. Uh, and um, we don't have still a statistically good answer because we're putting in a flux in here um, and uh, we're doing a ratio estimator. I'm going to um, leave more um, discussion about the statistical poorness of this, of this method to others, uh, just to say that we have recognized that it's a problem and we wanted to find a better, better solution. And so I asked this problem five years ago and Shaoli uh, came up with this method, uh, which I, was the first time I had ever heard about it, uh, called shrinkage. And what we're talking about is multiplicative shrinkage because what we have our instrument measurements are, are multiplied together, but we really want to do a, um, a linear analysis. Um, and so there's a transformation uh, to, uh, into, by the log space. So anyway, I'm not going to go over this in detail. We're going to, um, I'm sure, um, Young is going to go over this uh, quite a bit. What I like about this is that uh, there's an, an opportunity in all of this to apply weights to the um, to your to your data versus your initial effective areas. That's a little the little b here, and those weights include some feeling, some interpretation, some understanding of the uncertainty in the individual instruments. Um, um, effective areas. There's, this tau uh, represents a fractional uncertainty in the effective area that you place on your, on your prior, and therefore there's a weight that's applied for each individual instrument's un, uh, understanding of their own instrument, and um, that goes into the weights as well as the actual data statistical uncertainties. Okay, so that's the most I'm going to say about shrinkage. I'm going to leave uh, that to uh, Young to talk about in more uh, detail. Just want to get to the mechanics of what we're actually doing as well. Okay, so um, there is once you know once we've laid out this very simple problem of uh, finding the area for a given instrument where the predicted number of counts you know, uh, for the instrument and the, uh, and the source is just given by a simple equation, then we immediately recognize there are some real problems in, in how we actually go about doing these analyses. In reality, what we, did, what we do is we determine a flux and a band from an energy one to an energy two by, uh, by an inversion process. Here's an example over here of the uh, counts that are observed per unit energy in, in independent channels. And we do a fit. And in this case, there's a chi-square statistic that's being used because there are a lot of accounts in this. Um, and the band pass of interest is like one to eight keV there. So um, uh, what we're trying to do here is to get a measure of the flux in this band. And it's really an integral over the uh, true of the of the spectrum of the source, which I represent by this uh, Q sub J, um, an integral over the effective area, which has a, which changes with energy, and an integral over um, uh, over the response function of the detector. And here's an example down here in the bottom right corner of a uh, of a detector response. And you know um, it looks. You know, um, the, the, the input energy was four and a half keV on this, this higher, high energy. But you can see these, these interesting peaks in here, which you have as a kind of a non-local re redistribution matrix that, you, that, that determines uh, how much power is produced in each channel when you put in monochromatic uh, photons. So you have to do the integral and the sum uh, over all the channels in order to do this right. And so, this complication we've tried to sweep into a one value here. We're, we're putting all our ignorance into this one value, which, I, which we call capital T, which includes the exposure time, and it includes an integral over the shapes of the functions 
which uh, define the effective area um, and that we have a single normalization of the effective area and a, and a shape to it. We believe we know the shape reasonably well, but maybe we don't know the overall uh, level of the effective area. So this is the equation for the uh, true uh, or the model for the effective area, I should say. Uh, and we believe we have a shape function for the, uh, for the spectrum and that all we really need is a normalization, an overall normalization for the flux. Um, so that the, and most of our analyses should be relatively independent of the actual shape of this, um, uh, of that spectrum, which is, you can see is we, we are actually dividing it out here. Um, so that um, it turns out that it, we are, that when the band passes are relatively narrow, these E1 and E2 are close to each other, that um, the, the uh, flux that you measure in that band is relatively robust to all of this, all of this um, calculation here. Still, it's a complication. We have to deal with it. What we actually measure are these fluxes in the individual bands. So that's, that's just a complication that we have to understand this process of how we actually go about measuring measuring fluxes. The counts that we are comparing to in this calculation up here are the expectations of these, um, uh, just the sum over all the uh, pulse sites, all the channels for a given instrument, um, that K is the channel. And, um, and this, uh, we have a TIJ up here, which is just the sum of these uh, TIJ Ks uh, for all the different channels. So we, we have a process here. It's, uh, um, it's a complication that we have to work out. And um, this is now in the paper that where we talk about the details of how we handle our data. All right, so that's complication one. Complication two is that our effective areas are correlated. Um, this this um, figure up on the upper right is an example from um, one paper uh, I found that says that when you vary the uh, filter thickness, which is relative, can be uncertain, uh, at one energy, it can have a large effect. These well, a few percent uh, changes can have a large effect. But at another energy, at a, uh, it'll have an effect on the effective area but at a different scale. So there's a correlation between the effective area that you understand at one energy and that that you understand at another energy. So we can try to um, quantify this by saying that we have some parameters of the effective area model for a given instrument. And um, again, we, we are transforming to the log. So all this stuff is done in this um, so-called B space, the log of the area. So there are these parameters and a probability distribution for all these parameters, okay? So technically, you can just write that the best effective area or best log of the effective area is just the integral over this probability distribution for all the, over all these um, um, instrument um, parameters. And um, that will give you the, um, the best area that, uh, that you want to use. And you can define also a, an, a prior uh, variance of the effective area. So these uh, uh, uncertainties on the effective areas would come in here because you have a model of all the different effective areas. So you could derive a, um, a variance on your, on your prior. But well, we can go one step further and do the um, correlation coefficient between two different energies by just looking at the effective areas at those two energies and um, integrating over the probability and, and dividing by the, uh, uh, by the square roots of the variances. Sorry, that should be tau squares. The square roots of the tau squares. No, oh, that's right. Never mind. Anyway. Um, no, I think that's square root. Yeah. In any case, um, in reality, of course, this is all done by Monte Carlo um, because we don't actually have a full set of parameters for using the measure, measuring all the different parameters um, and a probability distribution for all of them. We just have estimates of what they might look like 
Um, and so there is a Monte Carlo which is used um, and uh, uh, Jeremy Drake and uh, Vina can talk more about that. So that's just one of the complications. And then we have another complication is that we need to have some assessment of our priors on our effective area. So we asked all of the calibration scientists for all the instruments that we're using in our analysis to assess their um, uncertainty, their fractional uncertainty in the effective area in um, lots of different band passes. Um, uh, the, these little dot dot dots mean that there's, there, that instrument doesn't have much effective area in, the, in that band pass. And, and so um, now we have a process that, that we can say um, with all of these um, uh, Herman? prior effective areas, yes? Uh, can I interrupt for just a minute to uh, note that uh, several of these people who gave you these star values are actually in the audience. And this right. might yes. be a good opportunity for them to uh, change the numbers if they want. Ha! Too late. <laughs> <laughs> They're in the paper. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm kidding there. Um, uh, let's see, I believe I got some from uh, Brian Greffestead, who's in the audience uh, for New Star, and uh, Christine Cruz Madsen. Let me see, and um, Steve Sembe uh, contributed uh, MOS, um, the XMM MOS um, uh, uh, parameters. Uh, let's see. I'm not changing. <laughs> um, I made up the numbers for HETGS. Um, and um, uh, Vina, did you make them up for the LETGS? I believe I did, yes. Yeah, well, make them up. Actually, J Jeremy did. Jeremy may have, uh, yeah. And that's uh, possibly also actually related to the, um, uh, the work that's being done on trying to estimate these effective areas, uh, estimate the effective area uncertainties and use those. Um, okay, so uh, we have tau values for all these different instruments. And then let me see, what, what do I have coming up next? We need data. Okay, so this is an example of a data set. <clears throat> Um, that um, uh, one of our collaborators provided, Matteo uh, Guainazzi. Uh, what we have is a, a flux uh, for lots of different targets from a catalog. Uh, we have uncertainties on those fluxes. Uh, these are just purely uh, photon statistics. Um, and uh, different <clears throat> instruments. And so now we can compare. And we did a, lo um, uh, a lot of this work in paper one, which I'm going to uh, go to um, Young to talk about here real quick. So these are uh, instrument data sets that we're working with. Um, a supernova remnant with 13 instruments um, and two different um, sort of energy bands, the oxygen and the neon lines. We have a catalog with uh, about 40 sources, uh, three, um, three different instruments. Um, and in the new paper, this, uh, these are all in paper one, the uh, uh, Chen et al. And in the new one, we have the same data sets as before, um, but we've added uh, Capella with uh, essentially eight different instruments uh, because there are plus or minus one orders on either side with 15 um, uh, different observations because they were a function of time. We've added correlations of the uh, band passes between the hard, medium, and soft. We've added correlations and it could spell it right next time. Uh, for, um, for EO102, and we've used these heterogeneous tau values that we saw, that we showed, I showed in the previous, um, um, previous slide. So um, I will um, you know, switch over, um, you know, give up the screen to, um, to Young to talk about what's actually in paper one where we published this, and we uh, announced the actual name, concordance, and um, noted that it was a product of IACEC, the International Astronomical Consortium for High Energy Calibration. And here I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Herman. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Perfect.
So I will talk about the calibration concordance model here. Um, Herman already did uh, all the introductions and tackled the difficult parts. So I'll skip all of these. Um, so this is the motivating example as Herman was talking about. And we were facing the scenario that uh, the data or the instruments do not agree with each other for the same sources. Um, so I'll begin with some notations to clarify everything. So we have n different instruments. And here for astronomers, I just want to mention that here the instruments are corresponding to each of the bands that, that Hermo is talking about. And we regard them as n different instruments. And the true effective area AI, that's the capital AI, is denoting the scale, scaling factor that Hermann uh, derived um, so that we don't have the energy dependence here. And for each of these instruments, we know an estimated little ai, um, but not the true ai. And the objective is to estimate the true ai. And we have m different sources, and each of the source has a true flux. And of course, we don't know the true flux of each of the sources. Um, and what we can observe are essentially the photon counts, uh, are essentially the measured fluxes. Um, um, for, for, for source J with instrument I. And here consistently, we're denoting the data or the estimators using the lower cases or the red color and the parameters and the estimate using the upper cases and the blue color. And the dilemma that we're facing is that if we just simply di divide the observed photon counts uh, by the effective areas, we obtain different res results uh, of estimated flux for the same object. And the scientific question that we face here is, are there any systematic errors in the non-effective areas? And can we derive properly adjusted effective areas? And can we unify the estimates of the same flux with the different instruments? And to answer those questions, we propose our statistical model. So as Herman just mentioned, the scientific model is essentially a multiplicative model on the original scale. And the, the uppercase CIJ denotes the expected photon counts. And the TIJ contain the exposure time, but also all of the complicated factors that Herman just talked about. And the true effective area times the true flux. And this is a multiplicative model and if we put them on log scale, we get, a, uh, we get an additive model. And to make the story simple, we, we assume the non-multiplicative non fa factor Tij is equal to one in this work. And the corresponding statistical model that we propose is a log normal distribution. So on a log scale, the logarithm of the observed counts will be essentially equal to the logarithm of the true effective area plus the logarithm of the true flux. However, here, in order to maintain the scientific model that on the expectation, the expected number of counts is equal to the um, effective area times the flux, we need this term here, which is really important here. And this is so-called half variance correction. And this is to guarantee that the expected number of photon counts and satisfy the scientific model. And for statisticians, this is a simple result from the expectation of the log normal distribution. And we have two different models. I think yeah, it's important just to point out for people why this is necessary. It's, it's a simple fact, the average of log is not of log of average. And so this is the statistical way of ensure that we will be able to fit an additive model on the log scale. But when we go back to take average, it will still maintain the average uh, on the original scale as the multiplicative model. And this, and the statistically, uh, the log normal model requires this half variance correction to maintain that property, to adjust for the fact that the average of expectations is not expectation of average. And you can see that if a C gamma is very small, then that adjustment is very small as well because if that if there's not much variation, then you know the the uh, the, the average basically is is just a fixed uh, constant, so that you don't need to make that adjustment. But usually the C gamma is not that tiny, 
and therefore this adjustment is important. If you don't make the adjustment, you take log, you fit the model, your final answer on original scale will be biased. Thank you. Um, and based on this, we have two different models. One is uh, we assume all of the variance parameters are known to us. And the other model is that we assume we don't know the variance parameters. Um, so here I'll just uh, give the Bayesian hierarchy model that we have. So the first layer is the, the model that I just talked about, which is the Gaussian noise model. The logarithm of the accounts conditioning on the effective area and the flux and the variance parameter are independently distributed as a Gaussian distribution uh, with some variance. And we assume that the logarithm of the effective area follow a Gaussian distribution with mean little bi, which is the logarithm of the known effective area. And this tau i squared are given by the calibration scientists uh, that Herman collected the table for us. And we assume that bgj, which is the logarithm of the fluxes, follow a flat prior, because we know nothing beforehand. And if we assume the variance is unknown, we assume sigma i squared follows an inverse gamma distribution. Um, how we are choosing the prior parameters, yeah. as I explained. Yeah, sorry, that I think it's important to point out that the model you wrote at the very top, the y equal to log counts, is actually a bit problematic, right? Because, because it has a half variance in it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that's, and, the, and, that's the yig prime. Yeah. Right, but, and also when a variance is unknown, you shouldn't write that way. You should have put the, right, the log on the right side. Uh, that, I mean, that, that the half variance correction on the right side, because it's going to be, uh, it's, it's, it's part yeah. of parameter, not the data, right? Just, yeah. just make sure people don't get it confused. Yeah. Um, so the way that we set the prior parameters is that uh, we set the priors for the effective areas by the scientific knowledge, and the others are just based on the variability of the data uh, and our ignorance about the, uh, about the parameter, for example, the flux. Um, so we studied, um, this is a log normal hierarchical model and there's a way of fitting this model. However, we studied different properties of this model. First is the posterior pro propriety. So um, the model has to be proper in order to, for us to make uh, inference. So the posterior is proper if each source is measured by at least one instrument. And this is a very minimal requirement, requirement that we have. And also the identifiability. If we assume that we don't have a prior knowledge about the effective area, that means the tau i squared is equal to infinity. If this is true, then the model is not identifiable because we have exactly the same likelihood or resulting same posteriors uh, with a shifted bi and gj. So this is not an identifiable model. And we studied the condition under which we have good identifiability in the model. So we studied the condition number of the precision matrix of the conditional Gaussian distribution of the effective areas and the fluxes. And we show that if the tau i squared is much larger than sigma i squared, then we have very elongated posterior contours. And then the computation and the inference will be difficult. And this is meaning that if the prior variance tau i squared is much, much larger than the observational noise, then probably we have a problem. Um, question, Yang. Yeah. So what is this condition number that you mentioned? I mean, how is this relevant to uh, the estimates? I mean, Oh, th this is just a, a way of studying the identifiability of the posterior distribution. Um, so we're looking at the conditional posterior distribution of the BI and GJ, and then the conditional posterior distribution of BI and GJ follow a Gaussian distribution. And if this Gaussian distribution has a degenerate covariance function, then the problem is not identifiable. That's why we studied the, the condition number of the precision matrix, which is the inverse of the covariance matrix. And it is defined as the largest eigenvalue divided by the smallest eigenvalue. And that's how we derived 
uh, the, identifi uh, the identifiability condition of this problem that the tau i does not cannot be too large as compared to the observational noise. So, uh, Vinay, let me just uh, uh, try to explain it in a, in, in a more intuitive way. Uh, you know, the, 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 for the Gaussian, the covariance matrix essentially is measuring the correlations, right? Uh, the off-diagonal correlations with these different variables. So basically, this is saying that you, you don't want that correlation matrix to be singular, right? Because you don't want it to be not invertible. But in, in reality, it's not going to be exactly not invertible. But what happens is that when the largest arcing value over the smallest arcing value, if the smallest arcing value is zero, that's what it says is not invertible. You know that condition number is going to be infinity because the denominator is zero. But even you don't reach the zero, if you have, a, you know, a, a, a essentially an ellipsoid is so elongated in one direction and then essentially be numerically incredibly unstable, but it's also indicated you don't have much information to distinguish between two, uh, you know, two, two, uh, two variables, but they're so highly correlated. So this is the way, this is the way to, uh, this conditional number is more a kind of a numerical analysis uh, type of indicator, but here also it's a good way to uh, quantify almost not identifiable. Yeah, here we don't have exact identify, uh, non-identifiability problem, but we, not, we have near non-identifiability problem if the tau is too large. Um, and now we have given the model, which is the Bayesian hierarchy model given on this page. And next is about the computation, how we do inference, how we infer the B, I, and G, J, uh, and also the sigma i for this problem. Um, so the Bayesian computation that we use is based on Markov tree Monte Carlo algorithms. Um, we could do Gibbs sampling, and this algorithm is based on updating the parameters one at a time. Um, and we can also do block Gibbs sampling and update the vectors of parameters um, at one time because we know the joint distribution of the B and G J is a multivariate Gaussian distribution. Um, and also we could do this new technique called the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, and we can implement this in the STEM package. The benefit of doing this Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is as I explained, the B, I, and G, J are highly correlated with each other and the posterior contours can be um, elongated. And for this type of, um, for this type of posterior contours, the Gibbs sampling is not really efficient. Let me, let me also add uh, just very quickly for people who may or may not be familiar with the MCMC. It's just a general class of microchain mod, uh, methods to compute from this uh, so-called Bayesian posterior, which is the way we summarize uh, the information about the B and, and the Gs. These different methods, uh, you can think about for those who are more familiar with solving kind of uh, uh, equations. You, the Gibbs sampling and the block Gibbs, Gibbs sampling is like solving these problems when you have multiple variables, you solve one at a time, assuming others known. And this is just a more stochastic way of doing it. And Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is more like the, like the newton raphson kind of exponential, uh, sorry, quadratic methods. They are much, much faster, but they're also uh, much less stable. You, you sort of need to know where things are uh, before those methods works well. So there is a trade-off between these different. Yeah, the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is using the gradient information of the posterior contour. So it's, it can be really efficient uh, in our case. Um, so I'll just uh, demonstrate the advantages of our model and our approach um, use, uh, from four different aspects. Um, the first one is an uh, intuitive explanation or mathematical ex explanation of the estimates. So naturally, hierarchical model gives shrinkage estimate, uh, gives shrinkage estimators, and in our model, we do have shrinkage estimators. On the log scale, as Herman just showed, the logarithm of the estimated effective area is a weighted average of the prior mean, uh, and the information coming from the observations. And the yi bar j, uh, yi bar here is the, is the cross source mean of the logarithm of the counts. Um, and again, it's corrected by the half variance correction. And the g bar here is the average 
of the logarithm of the fluxes. And note here that the first scenario is that the fluxes and the variance are known to us. So we have this nice weighted shrinkage estimator. If we put this back on the original scale, that's on the effective area scale, then the estimated effective area has this power shrinkage formula. And the weights are given by Wi and one minus Wi. And Wi is defined by the relative ratio of the precision. So we can look at this formula for Wi. Tau i squared is the variance, the prior variance. So tau i squared inverse is the prior precision. And m divided by sigma i squared is the precision of the observations. So this is saying if the pr prior is highly precise, that we trust our priors a lot, then wi is close to one, and we are shrinking our estimator towards the prior. However, if the prior is highly dispersed, in other words, tau i squared is really large, then wi is really close to zero, then we are shrinking this estimator towards the information coming from the observations. So this is the scenario of having a really impre imprecise prior so that we trust our data to give us the results. Uh, on the other hand, if we trusted the prior, then the result will be shrinking towards the prior. Um, when the fluxes are unknown and the variances are known to us, we have shrinkage for the logarithm of the effective area which is very similar to the previous formula. And also we have shrinkage for the logarithm of the fluxes. Um, and again, this is um, the, the other term for the shrinkage does not exist because the prior for this GJ is a flat prior. And when the variances are un unknown, we also have shrinkage estimators of the variance parameter. So, the shrinkage estimator of the variance parameter has this very interesting formula. This SYI squared is essentially the, um, the residual term uh, based on the mean squared error. So this, um, this one, if you have a regular model, this will be an estimate of the variance. However, in our half variance corrected formula, uh, in our half variance corrected log normal distribution, we have a self normalizing uh, variance uh, shrinkage for the variance. So the, the larger this residual is, um, the smaller this shrinkage term is. So it, it is uh, doing this sort of self normalization for the variance shrinkage. Yeah, let me let me just add a, a, a point here because it's both uh, important for 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 those statisticians to understand this. But I also wanted to say one word that this whole shrinkage estimation is a very common uh, method in in in, uh, in statistics in Bayesian statistics. It's not something we invented, which is very well known. All it does is that actually is a very intuitive. It basically says if you have multiple sources of the information you should weight each source information by how precise each one of them is. The, the one with high quality should weight them more, the one with low quality should weight them less. It's very intuitive. The methodology, what it does is really trying to estimate how precise each one is. Without, because you have information, you have a common ground that you can actually, with certain prior information, you can estimate that. So all these complicated machinery there, essentially is trying to put down how much weights I should attach to each, each source. Now here sources both means that you have uh, you have pride, your previous estimate of effective area and and what's being asked, what's being provided by you know by the data but it's also have because you also have so many instruments there so there essentially there's a proper weighting of them now what's interesting is this is one of the cases where the scientific problem drive the statistical development this phenomenon we discovered about shrinkage of the variance itself is actually quite new this is to to all the statisticians or students in the audience. The typical shrinkage estimate in the literature is about you know, average of the mean, like estimating the mean. But because our model explicitly introduced the variance into the mean, because we need to do the half variance correction, it turns out that the, the, the base formula tells us that your variance itself needs to be shrinked down as well. 
you don't overestimate your, your variance. And in fact, what's interesting is the larger the original variance estimated, the more shrinkage it, 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 you know, it will bring it down. And it, this is kind of, a, I think essentially is how, the, how this team works because we get these uh, scientific problems and then motivate us to discover new uh, statistical methods or theories. So this, this uh, self-shrink, self-shrinking phenomena for the variance, as far as I know, is, is actually quite interesting. Thank you. Um, and right, so next, quick, quick question on yes. that. Um, uh, so for the for the mean, uh, the shrinkage um, correction is uh, relatively straightforward, right? I mean, at least it's understandably written. As in, there are two weights, and then there are two factors which change according to the weight. Uh, there isn't something as simple for the for the shrinkage estimator for the of the variance. Um, so does that? Um, so, so where exactly is the shrinkage factor coming in? Right. So that's a that's a that's a great question. Uh, by the way, I want to first mention that uh, for scientists out there, statisticians are very bad in terms of come up with good names. Like I'm sure, like others that we create a much fancy name than shrinkage. You know, that's a <laughs> that's a term we have been using because the basic idea, obviously, shrink it together. I'm quite sure other field will come up with some kind of fancy uh, learning or, or some optimization term. So. Don't be, uh, don't be uh, fooled by, by the name that the shrinkage is essentially taking weighted the average. Now, uh, Bernay, to answer your question about this variance shrinkage phenomenon, I, I, I thought about, but here's what's interesting, right? Because the variance was used to correct the mean itself, you would imagine that if you have a bad correction, if the C gamma is, is, is very large, you will actually have a more corrections. So then when you form the residual variance itself, it's gonna be effective. So you see that, uh, that it, if you have a, a very large variance, it's going to also give you a very large correction of the Y. And in which case it will create further variance uh, correction itself because, they, because, the, because when it subtract, I mean, get the residual, the residual is going to be large. So I think that this is the model. I mean, it's, it's a nonlinear thing. I think that this is the, the mass itself is telling itself to regulate. Don't let itself go, go crazy because it seems like it can can go spiral, like larger get larger, larger get larger. And I think this is a, this is a beauty doing these, these mathematics, right? Uh, sometimes the things come out is very intuitive, like the weighted average. Sometimes those things come out are not intuitive. And this is where the mathematical power tells you, well, you know, after you think a while, you say, well, this might be intuitive, but initially that's how we are learning about how this behavior. So this is a, again, and I've been doing shrinkage for long, but this is a, a new phenomenon that I've never seen before. And I'm, and I'm not uh, explaining it very clearly just because I'm still learning about, but that's my current intuition, why it has this form. Now, I don't even know why this has a particular form. I know why it's trying to shrink it down itself, not make it crazy. Yeah, Thank you. mathematically, I can explain a little bit because if you can recall, the actual residual of this Gaussian model is actually yij plus the half variance correction subtracted by the bi hat and gj hat. And however, so this is not the true uh, mean squared error or the true residual of the Gaussian model. So, um, so we need to have this kind of correction. Um, so I will talk about the benefits of fitting the variances. So as I mentioned before, we have two different options for the variance parameter. One is that we assume the variances are known to us uh, because uh, for, for, for all of the data that I got from Herman and Vinay, uh, an error bar is attached to each of the operations. However, if we just uh, use that particular error bar, instead of fitting our own variance parameters, um, we might uh, get um, strange results in certain aspects. The benefits of fitting the variance parameter is um, uh, include more tolerance to the model, uh, model error or the model misspecification um, because our models are wrong. So um, trusting the given variances might give us some trouble in the model fitting. Um, and there are some pitfalls of assuming known variances. Um, if we have overly optimistic known variances, then we have overly narrow confidence intervals and that will lead to possible false discoveries. And if the known variances are much larger than the true variability in the dataset, then we give non-informative results. 
two, two large error bars are not nice or not, not desired in practice. Um, and we did some extensions to handle outliers because in astronomy, in astronomical observations, outliers exist. Um, so our extension is given as follows. We're extending this log Gaussian distribution to a log T distribution. The student T distribution is a distribution um, extending from the Gaussian distribution. It has a similar bell-shaped curve, but it has much fatter tails. So the way that we're extending from the Gaussian distribution to the log T distribution is by using the representation of the T distribution. A student T distribution can be represented by a Gaussian distribution divided by the square root of a chi-squared distribution. So that's how we extended our model to the log T model. Um, recall that previously in this term, we have a half variance correction, and this term is just our Gaussian noise. And now we define the half variance correction to be again dependent on instrument and the source. And the noise term is a Gaussian divided by a square root of chi-squared distribution. So we assume, if we assume the sigma ij, uh, the psi ij are independent chi-squared distributions, then the error term follows independent student t distributions. And we claim that this model is a more general model generalizing the previous log normal model because a special case is when sigma ij does not depend on j, then that will recover back to our log normal model. Um, so I'll, t uh, I'll show a numerical example with some outliers. In one simulation, we choose 10 different instruments and 40 different sources. And one of the logarithm of fluxes is equal to negative one. And the other logarithm of the sources is equal to three. Um, and we examined the residuals um, based on the um, based on the Gauss, uh, log normal and log t mo uh, model. And here are the results based on the log normal model on the top panel and the log t model on the bottom panel. So on the log, uh, for the log normal model, the standardized residuals cross the negative two and two lines. So we do have see a lot of outliers here and there based on the log normal model. However, if we fit the log t model, the standardized residuals are all within negative two and two interval, so that the log t no model does not really suffer from the series outliers. And with, we, we compared the coverage properties uh, with the outliers um, uh, with model, mis um, model misspecification. So the model are simulated based on a Poisson model, and we choose different number of instruments. We choose 10 different instruments and 40 different instruments. And the coverage probabilities, um, we are looking at a nominal 95% uh, posterior intervals. So the coverage probabilities around 95% will be desirable. Uh, and the length of the interval, the smaller, the better. So this result is showing the contrast between the log normal model and the log T model. For the cases where we don't have outliers, both the log normal and log T model perform really well. When we have outliers, the log T model perform much better than the log normal model based on the coverage probability. And the length of the interval are actually comparable with each other. Um, so I will just show some results from the data sets given by Herman and Vinay. Um, the first one is based on this E0102 data, and we have four different sources from four different spectral lines of the E0102. And here are our results of the estimates of the logarithm of the effective area. And the top panel is based on the oxygen, and the bottom panel is based on the neon data. And the bars are the 95% posterior intervals. And the black lines are showing the tau values equal to 0.5, and the blue ones are showing the tau values equal to 0.025. Uh, and here we are assuming 
all of the tau values for all of the instruments are equal to each other. And Herman will show more when we use the true tau values given by the scientists. Um, and another uh, interesting aspect is how much uh, the prior information is dominating in the inference. So we define this vector, which is given by the shrinkage formula about this prior influence. And here I'm showing the fraction of the prior influ influence for the different tau values. For the oxygen data, when the tau is really, really small, the prior influence is not negligible. However, when we increase the tau value to 0.05, the prior influence is actually very negligible for majority of the instruments. And this is similar for the NEON. Um, we also have two, two XMM data sets. Um, and for this data sets, we have three different instruments. Um, and we have... Um, um, actually, yeah, a quick question uh, about the sprite influence. Uh, so is there a recommended sort of uh, sweet spot uh, for what, we sh what people should aim for uh, in terms of prior influence? Like is 50% uh, good enough or 25%? What, what, is, what is the thing to... Um, it really depends on your confidence on the prior. I think this is a, a post-inference assessment of the impact coming from the prior. Because in order to calculate this prior influence, we need to make an inference for the various parameters in our model. Okay. So this is like a post analysis assessment of how much uh, the prior is influencing the results. So essentially, I mean, if, if we believe that um, uh, our priors, you know, if we believe, for instance, that uh, our estimates of the effective area are very, very uh, well known, uh, then it's not a concern even if the, um, uh, even if the prior influence gets to 90%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. For example, we do have one of them where we have the uh, prior influence equal to 0.9, but only for one of them. Yeah. Um, and then that's the XM, XMM data set. Uh, we have the hard band, the medium band, and the soft band. And for each band, we have more than 40 different sources. Uh, and here are the results for the two XMM results. Uh, and we're showing that essentially we don't really need much adjustment for the logarithm of the effective area because all of our error bars are covering the zero line. And then we have another data set called the XKL data set. Uh, and these are based on the bright active gallic uh, nuclei from the XMM Newton cross calibration sample. And again, we have hard and medium and soft band. And here we have each around 100 uh, sources. Um, and here I'm showing the results of the estimated logarithm of the fluxes for. Uh, for four, four, four of the sources. So um, if we don't, if we don't do, our, we don't work on our model, that is, we just uh, do each instrument separately. Um, for for the first uh, for the first source, the three different instruments give similar results. However, for this last source, the three different instruments, PN, MOS one, and MOS two, give very different results and the error bars do not, does not even overlap. However, if we work on our basic hierarchical model, that's the last two error bars given in each of the panels, then we see that um, the, the results from the three different uh, instruments are combined to give our final error bar. And actually the error bar that we give has a smaller length as opposed to the individual error bars because we are combining information from all of the three different instruments to make inference about the source, um, about the source flux. Um, yeah, it's, it's maybe, go back, go back to the slide. It might be worthwhile to point out, for example, if you look at the uh, 3C120, you will see the basing results with, will have a much, much narrow bar. And the reason is because your, the three original measurements are pretty consistent with each other. When things yeah. are very consistent with each other, this just say, 
the base method essentially just you know say well because you guys are so concerned with each other by aggregating them you should get a much less bar right a much less error bar because you have much more information but when things are not consistent with each other and this base mass essentially is struggling uh, it will start to, you know still you still see the bars a little bit of less but because the difference between them are big they're trying to take into account these uncertainties due to that. But the overall, again, the idea here is so-called the shrinkage estimate is trying to shrink it towards a, a, a sort of common, common estimate. But these estimates, the Bayes estimate, just like many other statistical estimates, they don't just give you an estimate, they also give you an uncertainty. The uncertainty itself reflects the, 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 the quality of the original study as well as how different they are. The more different they are, the, le the more uh, uncertainties la later. So you basically get both. You get a better estimated uh, a center, but you also get a combined uncertainty estimation. And both of them reflects both the quality of the origin study as well as how they differ from each other. Yeah. So um, I, have a, I have another question uh, just uh, to make sure I understand that you're plotting. So what you plot here is the measurement of the intensity of the cells or flux of the cells on the so, y-axis? That's the logarithm the log. of the fluxes. Yeah, 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 okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, so that's why on a, that's on, and that's all negative. And also Herman did something for the TIG factor. So in order to interpret the true flux, we need to multiply uh, something back. Uh, and again, we assess the, the prior influence. And in this case, uh, regardless of the choice of the tau value, the prior influence is really small. Again, because here we have more than 100 uh, sources for each of the instruments, and we only have three different instruments. So this is uh, giving a much smaller prior influence. And again, in this case, it's showing that the larger data set, the more information that you have, the smaller the prior is going to impact the results. Um, and here I'm just uh, going to summarize here. Uh, we give a um, multi multiplicative mean modeling through a log normal hierarchical model. And later on, we extended this to a log T model. And we studied the, the, the shrinkage estimators for the effective areas, the fluxes, and also the uh, self-normalizing shrinkage estimators for the variance parameters. We did the basic computation based on Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms. Um, and we studied the, the potential pitfalls of assuming the known variances for the observations. Um, and for, for a scientific perspective, we actually give the adjustment factors of the effective areas for each of the instruments uh, based purely on the observations. Um, and ongoing and future work include we are going to incorporate correlations among the instruments, and Herman will talk about this. Um, and we're also interested in the robustness to the, mis uh, to the model misspecification here. Um, and we are actually also interested in the coverage properties when, when real outliers exist. In all of the data sets, Herman already cleaned everything up nicely to have removed the outliers. Uh, I'll just uh, acknowledge all of the contributors. Uh, Xu Fei, who is currently in Two Sigma, Shirley, uh, and David, Herman, and Vinay. I'll stop here. Oh, thanks, Yang. Let's see, there's a clapping thing over here, which we'll see if it works. Uh, back to Herman, I guess. Okay. Um, getting this taking over the screen again and finding this one, yes. Oh, actually, sorry, before you go uh, uh, start again, Herman, I just want to uh, check if anybody has any questions for Jan. Uh, there's of course, you know, opportunity for more uh, after your, uh, after your, uh, the rest of your talk is done. But uh, if anyone has immediate stats questions, this is your opportunity to uh, ask a real statistician. We have many statisticians on this call, actually. That is true. <laughs> ask, yes, ask, ask, 
several real statisticians uh, instead of having to make do with people like Herman and me. Making do. Yeah, it is, yes, exactly. They are making do. <laughs> uh, okay, so if there are no questions, uh, Herman, uh, it's off, you know, it's yours. Okay, so I'm just going to go through um, uh, the results of the work um, that um, uh, that uh, from the extension of the um, uh, of the uh, analysis that was done in uh, paper one that um, Young showed, and uh, uh, and a few other things here. Okay, so uh, first we have the uh, results for EO 102, um, which Young showed. And I just wanted to highlight that. Uh, we have examples now for the previous cases of, um, of um, uh, two different fixed values of the tau, the uh, uh, prior, uh, certainly on the prior, the heterogeneous one where we change the um, uh, prior as a function of instrument, okay, and then correlated uh, um, uh, taus, which means that uh, in this case I'm showing the oxygen uh, the combination of the oxygen seven, oxygen eight lines, uh, but now oxygen seven, oxygen eight are correlated with neon nine, neon ten, uh, because the effects on the effective area are similar in some sense, and so uh, there's actually a very strong correlation between those two energies for most of these sources. So if you include that, one of the things that happens is you see that all of the estimates for uh, the effective area change for the gradings, let's say, in this case, were all high until you actually included the correlation with the, uh, with the neon results. So it, what, that it, uh, what that's saying is that the neon results were low, uh, indicated low effective area, uh, and that the combination of the oxygen and the neon results give a net uh, lower uh, effective area. Okay, you can see that that occurs in a few cases, but another thing that occurs is that you see a little more stabilization of the correction factor that's implied. Uh, that when you have two different tau values, when you think all the uh, effective areas are very accurate, then hardly any of them change from their prior. Uh, but when you start including all of the um, uh, prior estimates on the effective areas and and their uncertainties, and then the correlation between them, you, you can see that we kind of um, uh, get better uh, and more definitive uh, changes to the effective areas. Okay, so that's uh, 1EO102. Um, for the XMM um, cross-cal sample using the catalog sources, when we when we finish the results for uh, the fixed case, okay, which are the um, golden rod and black, you can see that the error bars are pretty much all overlap one for the soft band. At, you, would in, you would say no, no need to bother changing effective areas. But once we included the, um, uh, the heterogeneous uh, tau values and uh, the correlation between the soft band and the medium band and the hard band, then you start to see that all of the MOS effective area estimates uh, rise up and it looks like there is an indication of a correction factor needed for the MOS compared to the PN, which, which um, uh, drifted up toward essentially no correction. After looking at the correlations, and using the priors, uh, you know, the estimates of uh, the uncertainties in those priors. And so the, one of the, the things that occurred here is that the, um, the PN prior estimate was something like 2%, whereas that for the MOS was something like 5 to 10%, depending on the band pass. And so, you know, one can understand why the, uh, a change of the effective area is now recommended after uh, such an analysis. Herman, just a quick question. Are these bars 50% or 95%? I believe they're 90%, right? Which 90%. Is 5% to 95%, right? Yeah. Okay. Is it, because remember some previously we're talking about like the 50%. No, I believe these are 90% enclosed. 
Did not include. Um, okay. Enclosed uh, posterior. Okay. All right. Um, and so that so that that was interesting. That previously we we said, oh, don't you don't need to do anything. But the error bars, the error, the range of the possibilities was actually quite quite large. And and uh, now if we look at the XML blazars, the ones for which we have to worry about pile up and there's some clipping and it's a bit of an uncertainty, there was a suggestion of something like a five percent adjustment uh, to the PN. You could see uh, the the golden rod in black there looked 5% low, and then maybe just a couple of percent to the um, changes to the, um, uh, to the moss. But within including the, the prior and the correlated effective areas, now we get an answer which is actually consistent, you know, remarkably consistent with the two XMM catalog results, that only a, a few percent change for the PN and a five to 7% change for the moss. So we actually have a more concordant result by uh, including the, uh, the better effects, the new effects, um, the, um, uh, the heterogeneous and uh, correlated effective areas. So I think that's a, 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 a nice uh, result from the more recent, uh, more recent results. And then finally, we added another data set, which is um, a Capella. These are emission lines from Capella in four different, um, four different strong emission lines, um, neon 10 through oxygen 8 at different energies. Okay, um, many um, observations were compared um, at different times. Uh, and in the, in one of the interesting cases here is that this had a, a, some, uh, some sparseness to it, that there were um, cases where we didn't actually have all four, or sorry, whatever, eight, uh, ten, uh, eight, eight of these different um, uh, combinations. And so uh, because of that, the machinery that um, Young and uh, Chauffe uh, built up allowed for this, as long as there were some observations uh, taken with each instrument combination. So the general results from here is that we have the plus and minus orders are generally quite consistent. That's what the, the red versus blue is. They're all uh, just the different, um, uh, different orders. Um, and that once you look at the um, uh, overall, you'll see that overall the LETGS uh, values are low compared to the uh, HETGS values. Now we don't really know which one's correct at this point, uh, as in, in some sense correct, but we knew, do know that there, in these uh, data indicate that there should be a correction for uh, at least one of these two uh, instrument effective areas. Uh, Herman, uh, just to yeah. clarify, I think the red and blue are as before, correlated versus heterogeneous. The plus and minus are actually oh. in the labels uh, underneath. Oh yeah, yeah, right, 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 sorry, right. Red and blue, um, yeah, that's right. Um, uh, you can see LET, ACES LETG minus ACES LETG plus. That's why you get um, eight different combinations. So you have uh, two different gradings, two different detectors, and two different um, uh, orders. That's why there are eight data sets. Right. So, um, so this, was, um, uh, this was really useful. And uh, again, we used the correlations uh, between the bands and that made the uh, results, uh, you know, they were still consistent with what we had before, but more, um, um, distinct, you might say. All right, and so now one other thing that one would uh, think about is we've shown these bands, you know, which are the 90% uh, the enclosed, but you also kind of want to know uh, what do the posterior distributions actually look like. And so I made up a little figure here with a sampling of the posterior distributions that uh, Young and uh, Chauffe uh, did that, that fall out of the analysis. And most of them look like the top row there. I just picked a sampling of them. Um, so the A, B, C, D, E, F here refer uh, across um, right, left to right, top to bottom. So A, B, C, D, E, F. Um, it took a while to find cases where the distribution had some weird shape. So I have very few of them. We, we 
don't see very many cases where there's some weird uh, shapes and um, the occasional tail in the distribution. See, there's a little tail uh, to the high end here, a little tail to the high end over here, indicating that it's not quite really a Gaussian posterior. Um, but I had to search quite a bit through um, dozens of these um, uh, posterior distributions in order to find cases that uh, uh, deviated significantly from, or that have apparent deviations from, uh, from a Gaussian appearance. So Herman, I think that's pretty good. Herman, yeah. these, are the, these are the posterior of the log of the flux log of effective area. Log of effective area. Log of effective area, I see. So when there's a, when it's centered at some high value, that means that the effective area has to be corrected, uh, but that the, uh, the range of possible effective areas is nicely distributed around uh, whatever that mean is. So this is a, Jan, we might be, uh, it might be interesting to, uh, to confirm uh, uh, Herman's claim that these are actually Gaussian look like. I mean, they, they look symmetric. That doesn't mean necessarily Gaussian, right? Because we have been doing all kinds of T's, other stuff, but it would be useful to do a quick check, do some, you know, fitting normal. Would you do a KS test? Yeah, do, do, do some quick test to see whether these are actually, even just calculating the kurtosis or something that will, will get you a quick indication whether they are really, I mean, there are probably good reasons why they're Gaussian, right? It's a central limit serum. Yeah, because the conditional distribution of the B and J are Gaussian. And it's like a, essentially a mixture of Gaussian over gamma distributions. I see. So, well, over gamma, uh, gamma independent yeah, the gamma. Sigma right? I squared are essentially chi squared. So that's essentially gamma. Yeah, but that should be still maintain the symmetry, right? Because that's essentially like a T. That doesn't yeah. explain that, uh, that, that tail. That's why probably it's, that's why it's first it's very hard to find something asymmetric. Uh, but then it's still something interesting. Maybe that's caused by, by the variance part. Because the mixture. Because it's mi a continuous mixture. But For mixture okay. distributions, you can have tails. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this is one figure that we haven't actually added to the paper yet, and I, um, I'm suggesting that we do something like this because we were <laughs> at one point thinking of, um, well, maybe we should put in an appendix all of the posterior uh, distributions, and I was like, well, no, that's 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 a lot, and so uh, I scanned through them to find. Um, to find what looked like to be typical cases and uh, some cases that looked uh, certainly uh, atypical. Yeah, that's, a, that's useful, yeah. All right, so um, those are posteriors. Um, we've kind of you know, run the gamut of what we've, um, of what we've talked about. Um, I believe that uh, our general uh, approach here has been fairly um, successful, that we can bring observations into concordance uh, we have some simple situations which give good answers. Uh, I think um, um, most of what we've done here doesn't, you know, um, uh, do doesn't really um, go counter to our intuition and our, and our uh, perception of uh, the situation. We were looking at some um, uh, com more complex situations uh, that Young also mentioned. Uh, one is, and I'm illustrating this on the right side here, is that the fluxes in the bands are actually related globally for, for in, in many cases. For example, this one case that we show on the right here, the different band passes that are defined by the vertical dashed lines. And the overall spectrum of the source is, um, looks like pretty much a power law throughout this entire range. And yet what we do is we fit each band independently for a flux and a, um, and a spectral slope, which is why these look like they have, um, it looks like a piecewise uh, power law, but reality isn't like that. The sources don't really have little discontinuous jumps at our predefined uh, bandpass uh, uh, boundaries. So uh, what we would like to be able to do is to put in a, a condition that relates, for example, the, the power law shape and the smoothness of this spectrum across all of these many different band passes. This is not a correlation between the effective areas of, those, of these band passes, but between the physical uh, uh, source uh, 
the emission mechanism, which relates the low energy flux to the high energy flux via very simple, um, uh, uh, very simple model. It just happens we we are we one of the reasons why we use these sources uh, that are power law shaped is because they give us more readily interpretable uh, spectra that and we can see uh, errors we can see problems with them and so uh, these power law sources we should take advantage of some of that information of that extra information and relate the fluxes and bands globally so that's one of the situations we're talking about uh, adding up next. Another thing that happens is that the effective areas are not actually um, in, in, uh, completely independent in time in that uh, some component of your system like the uh, mirror's effective area will be the same over time perhaps, but your detector may change in time. And, you, and we have uh, often uh, simple uh, models that will connect these uh, time-dependent uh, uh, phenomena time-dependent measurements. So um, that's all I have for my uh, formal presentation. I do have a kind of a bonus slide since we have a couple more minutes. Uh, my bonus slide is where we're going to go next in complicating our uh, concordance analysis. This is a um, the so-called um, uh, cross-cal, the Blazer, Blazar cross-cal a, a data set that we've been working on, uh, our, our Chandra team and the XMM team, where you have different instruments on the XMM uh, uh, instrument on the top, different band passes normalized to some one instrument. And on the bottom, we have uh, the Chandra instruments in different band passes for the same sources averaged over uh, many different observations at these deviations or averaged over many observations before 2008 and then after 2008. And uh, what we see is an overall shape uh, problem that occurs in, our, in one of our instrument analyses, which, the, um, which is susceptible to contamination. And so uh, we can connect these in time, and then we have these, in, um, these energy dependent uh, deviations. And we'd like to be able to put all of this into a more global analysis to make um, effective area um, um, uh, adjustments to the MOS instrument, the PN, the, um, the RGS, and, the, and Chandra, uh, and one grand concordance analysis. So there's like a little preview of what we might be able to um, uh, work on, uh, maybe able to pull, uh, put it into the concordance uh, system in the um, upcoming year or two. And that's all I've got for uh, today's presentation. Hi, thank you, Herman. Oh, well, I don't know if anyone uh, has any questions. I'll, I'll talk for you. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I have a question. This is Anita. Uh, so it's maybe, uh, I guess it's to both of you. So we've got, uh, so, so far, I understand that you were looking at the data which are the sources which are used for calibration. But if I have an observation and I have my source now observed with two, two, two instruments, let's say, you know, Chandra and Swift, and I want to understand whether there is any variability in, in the source because there are different epochs, how would I use this uh, methodology in the real situation like that, let's say? And to Yang. <laughs> I believe so the, the process should work. Right. So, you know, I understand that the current concordance assumes the, you know, this narrow bands and the power law within the band, right? For the no, flux. No, it's, it's, no, it is a, I mean, you don't need to make that assumption, right? I mean, it is, it is assumed to be the whatever it is for a given band. Um, yeah, but if I have my source and I want to, so, so in my analysis, I'm using the Rs, which are generated by Chandra and Swift in this case, right? And I'm doing my analysis just 
you know, without concordance. I'm doing my analysis using the provided uh, ARFs as we normally do, right? Okay. So now I have this result and I see that my fluxes differ. And I know that okay. there is a difference in calibration. And I know okay. it's two percent, yeah. So, uh, but how uh, I let me, include let me, this, yes. Yeah, let me make a comment and then Yang can tell me how I'm wrong. Yeah. Uh, so right now, concordance uh, assumes that the flux, the source fluxes um, are well determined, uh, and that the uh, they're, they're the same roughly. Yeah. Uh, and and then tries to adjust for the effective area, uh, but the machinery is general enough that if the effective areas are right, uh, or assumed to be right, then there is no reason why you can't get the fluxes out. Uh, you know, changes in the fluxes out. So if you have these two measurements and then uh, you find that there are adjustments needed for the, uh, for the fluxes as opposed to the effective areas, uh, then you can say that there, is a, there should be a difference, right? Yeah, I understand that. But in this case, I'm fixing ARFs, assuming that you know, your methodology provided me with the correct ARF, right? Yeah, and essentially you would have, yeah. you would be, to use this particular software, you would just use uh, this, the ARFs that come out of the um, CalDB or whatever, and right. with, with a tau of 0 0.001 or something. Right. So you're, right, you're right, right. forcing it to be right. Right. Now that's, that's fine. So if I have a, a calibration product which contains these corrections in it, I should be able to use it on any data. I assume this is my ARF. This is my tau, which goes with the ARF, and this is my source model, which is whatever, right? In my standard oh, Sherpa no, 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 no. Oh, okay. no, I'm thinking Sorry, about no, I, I am using this. Your question. this. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear two different uh, uh, kinds of things that can be done. A, yeah. um, use the standard values of the ARFs and, and uh, yes. RMFs, and then okay. tell okay. us what the effective area difference should be, okay? using the concordance method, tell us what the uh, answer is, or B, take our charts of where we say, oh, uh, we think the effective area of this one should go up and this one should come down. And you know, what can you do with this is what, you're, uh, what you may be asking. Yeah, I, I, how, I, I, how can I use the results that we have now to improve yeah, I, your analysis so you get better answers? And exactly. there is something question. we have not done yet, because we haven't been able to convince anyone to make changes on the basis of this work. This work. <laughs> well, but, yeah, uh, I have a you know. Sorry. So Herman, on that note, um, are you able to turn the problem around and publish uh, an adjusted um, standard model for 1E0102, which is your guess at what the statistically most likely spectrum is for use with future instruments. I like that idea. We have not considered uh, doing uh, such a thing. I think that's a good uh, subject for yeah. the um, um, for the the thermal supernova remnant group in the um, in IACHEC to consider um, whether or not such of effective area changes as we might recommend which also come with uh, flux, uh, best, uh, better estimates or some estimates of, of flux values that would come in, that would uh, bring about concordance as well. Right. Yeah, I, I think it will be good to think about users like the you know, X-ray astronomers who work with the data and we do use multiple detectors. So we have observations with XMM, Chandra, New Star, Swift, right? And you want to use all of them in your uh, analysis. So The way I look at this is that IACHEC was uh, started originally, A, to try to find standards, B, right. to, to try to find out where the errors are. Okay, so right. there I showed some uh, plots, of, you know, people were finding differences, right? So the, the next step is um, how do you go about figuring out, um, you know, what changes to make? And then the net last step, try to make those changes. Right. Uh, exactly. And, you know, we are building the machinery for determining what those changes should be. 
Um, and once we've done a reliable system where we've got consistency in all our answers, and, and so we can present this to the IA check for, uh, for you know, um, as a hypothesis as to where to, where to go next. Um, yeah, in no, that hurts. I, I want to mention that the machinery we have built actually creates can create a further estimate, right? If you think about what we're estimating simultaneously, we're estimating the effective area, we're estimating the flux, but we're also estimating the errors of the instrument okay. with certain assumptions. So there is a certain component. That's probably the, the one you know we have least to talk about, but the, that is a part of, like Jan was talking about why you shouldn't fix, just guess that you know, there's some information. Of course, you know, there's no free lunch here. There are lots of assumptions being made. So as, as far as this machinery goes, that if statistically speaking, these are all just parameters spit out by the posterior, no matter which way you want to look at. But it depends on your focus. Uh, you'll be adjusting differently, right? Because you know yeah, some yeah. some of these assumptions are more harmless for certain parameters, but more harmful for others. So I think there are further tuning we can do. It depends on what the goal, whether you want to use the, for the flux estimation, for the effective area estimations, for the variance estimations, or even for some downstream uh, analysis uh, yeah. with these as the input and. Uh, but there's a, even a further use of that. Uh, this, is, this is the beauty of doing the posterior, right? Because the, all the estimates that comes with uncertainty expressed by the posterior. So if you have a further analysis, a downstream analysis, you want to make any adjustment, you can just sample from this posterior and it propagates into whatever yeah, the next analysis, you will see the uncertainty, at least due to this stage of the uh, estimate. Mm -hmm. So you can get the kind of uncertainty estimate I would not encourage people just sort of get the best estimate, plug in, then go next stage because we know there's lots of uncertainty. As Herman showed his posterior, they're yeah. not, you know, they're they're nice, uh, uh, symmetric looking, but they're not entirely narrow. There, there, there are quite a bit of uncertainty right. there. And if that matters, particularly for all these nonlinear and analysis later on, I think uh, we should keep doing this pro properly, propagate these kind of uncertainty. Yeah, I was also uh, thinking about you know, the catalogs, because each mission generates the catalog. So Herman had, Herman or Young, actually, Young was showing the XMM catalog, and we have Chandra source catalog. So all the catalogs have uh, fluxes uh, generated, given certain assumptions. So we use the Rs, which are, you know, fixed and stable at that point, and, you know, the catalogs give us fluxes. So now, I guess given the eye check uh, uncertainty, one could uh, you know, do this analysis and think about, you know, include some uncertainty on this fluxes also uh, from the calibration perspective or cross calibration. Just thinking in a global way, right? Because we just released Chandra source catalog and we didn't include any of this information in and people take a source there and then XMM source and the flags don't agree, the flags is so. I see Keith right. is out of space. Where are you? Oh yeah, Keith is somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, on, I'm on the International Space Station. Oh wow. Oh That's yeah. What a yeah. real place. <laughs> yeah. It's a good metaphor for a social isolation. <laughs> <laughs> wow, look at that. Um, actually, so I had a, I had a question. Um, to do with the correlation, correlation of tau's. So I could believe that a calibration scientist might be uniformly optimistic or pessimistic. Can you actually build that into your model? Yeah, it's possible, but Herman has been talking to us about how to detect those people who are overly optimistic right. um, based on this. Um, yeah, I think a uh, proper calibration of the um, of the prior impact might show something uh, because if one of the tau values is extremely small as opposed to the others compared to the estimated uh, noise level, then we can su suspect. But we cannot say for sure like who is being overly optimistic. Carmen, what do you say about that? We, we, actually, we actually talk about this thing, but I, but I thought it was very interesting that if you want to do this thing correctly, there's a way of doing it, but we shouldn't talk about it. Because once you talk about people are going to 
change their way of <laughs> reporting what you know what you know what the tout are because you can look at historically how people report their errors for other studies right and and you know there should be some consistency because you know people say oh my bar is plus minus this percent but if you look historically and then you ask someone to give a report you you have some information to see whether for that particular occasion people are overly confident or endly confident if that's a word that compared to this person's historical record but that's a kind of a no, there, are, there, are, there are some information there. I, I, you know, I believe that. Uh... Yeah, and also there's the rounding issue because in the meeting that I joined with Herman, people were shouting out the numbers like two, five, ten, and fifteen. So those are only the numbers. Those are the only numbers that people come up with, and I don't really trust that. It's not seven or eight. It's five or ten. Um, it's not I, three point one four or five the, nine. Uh, the shouting out. Um, I mean, the problem with estimating the error is, 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 is not just estimating the unknowns, it's, it's the unknown unknowns. Um, there's a long list of things that happen in a project between building an instrument which gets photons in at one end and spits numbers out at the other. And uh, truly being able to estimate the uh, the uncertainty is is often simple guesswork, and so, and there's a bit of politics involved as you as you've just said. So, I can I can imagine that. I mean, this this problem is not unique for. I mean, I know you guys have all these errors, but not you guys have errors. You have these issues that uh, uh, many other fields you know, all have this this problem. There is actually interesting. I recently worked on this thing. There is a general statistical theory uh, somewhere that it takes some assumptions. Usually that if you, if whatever you believed multiply by two um, covers you quite a bit. It's a, it's, it, it's not just, you know, mindless to say, well, multiply by something, but it actually has, has good reasons that, that uh, for accounting for the models and the other stuff, you know, multiply with two on the variance scale, not on the standard deviation scale. That, uh, so it's two, um, not pi? No, well, unfortunately, yeah, the, yeah, the series is not that fancy, you know, we, we haven't come up with okay. a pi series, but there's a two series that actually is, <laughs> Like, you know, all these instruments, uh, if anything correlation, if you ignore the correlation that you can multiply by two, that's upper bound. Um, that, uh, uh, that's, that you can prove theoretically, so. Yeah, one thing that just came up, um, uh, one thing you mentioned, Charlie, is the, yeah. is the um, posterior estimates of the variances by instrument, because we, uh, we've uh, defined um, sigma sub i, so that's a, um, uh, a, um, an uncertainty associated with each instrument that's determined regardless of the photon statistics in the actual flux measurements. And uh, we have not actually uh, taken a look at that, those results by comparison to the, to the statistical uh, measurements that we've made yet. And that would be something worthwhile um, examining in the uh, f uh, further. And that might actually be able to tell us who's lying. <laughs> So do you want to know, you know, maybe you should have someone else do the analysis of <laughs> complete separate, <laughs> but, but yeah. I'm near retirement. I, I can do this. I, I, okay. If I get fired, it won't be that big a deal. <laughs> Fight because of uncertainty. Yeah, that's a nice title uh, for article. The, uh, uh, the, you know, that's a definitely, definitely. I mean, speaking of posterior, I also want to ask you, you were creating posterior for the, uh, for the log of effective area. I mean, you know, it's a nice symmetric, uh, but I think for the paper, what uh, what your colleagues feel more direct, want to see the posterior of the original scale, which will be skewed, but that also tells you where things are. No, you don't want? Okay. Yeah. It's hard enough to just get a number, let alone try to characterize, you know, your uncertainty, you know, plus or minus, you know, in which direction and by how much. And, you know, the way I look at it is the reason why I asked the calibration scientists to just give me a number without actually going and working on it is that it's based on a history and a, you know, an experience of how many times they've had somebody come to them and say, hey, I got a different answer than XYZ did. Mm -hmm. Or, hey, you know what? Every time I do this measurement, it looks, looks perfect. You know, it's right on. And it's, so the the method of trying to get, you know, these uh, tau values for each of the different teams, I believe is not altogether, um, you know, shady, 
you might say. It's, but, you know, it, it gives, it, I think it gives the right magnitude, you know, in that when someone says 2%, they may be, it may be 3% instead, but when someone says 10%, they're probably not 3%. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. Okay. In other words, there's no way that someone's going to tell you 10% and it's really 3%. That's just, that's just, that's really unlikely. Well, it sounds like there's a calibration problem in terms of these errors themselves. You want to see properly calibrate over the time. Well, like, you know, okay. Anyway, let's look at the sigma i's and that'll tell us something, I think. Um, yeah, we, could, we, we really haven't looked at those yet. It, there'll be also interesting to look at the sigma i's that how they change once you introduce the correlation between the band, you know, these, uh, these uh, mm -hmm. different bands. Yeah. Because uh, that should also impact the sigmas as well. Yeah, um, actually, I just thought of something that uh, might, uh, and Annetta might be interested in. One thing I'd, um, uh, I had suggested to people a while back was to, um, was to publish these deviations as, um, uh, as parameters of a spline, let's say, with uncertainties on them that you can then apply to your data as an additional multiplicative factor, okay? And then what we would do is supply the values and the, um, you know, whatever, the, 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 the knot points, the spline points, mm -hmm. you know, at various locations and tell, tell, tell you a sort of a prior range, you know, based on, the, based on these posteriors and then let you go through and say, hey, you know, Within these range, within this range of where these effective area differences can be, I can I can get a better fit to my data. So what you're talking about, uh, Herman, is essentially reverse engineering uh, the MCCAL uh, Jeremy's simulation um, yeah. samples. Well, um, no. Um, I think it's a it's a little more right because this is like additional kind of model component. I mean, the question is if you want to, if you have a spline and you have a priors, do you want to use that uh, in addition to the arts? Yeah, I mean, uh, essentially yeah. what Jeremy is doing is generating the sample of effective areas, right? Uh, yeah. Which we use in pi blocks, for example. Right, uh, right, right, right. Sorry, I didn't uh, understand it. That, that connection, yeah. I mean, that, and we could use that already in uh, Sherpa software because we have, you know, we have this uh, track base and full base uh, yeah. uh, so, coded. So if you have so, little, uh, I don't know, bands at different energies, you could mm -hmm. sort of draw. Yeah. You would need to, yeah, you would need to implement this as a model or as a correction to R. Somehow, I don't know if Keith uh, uh, can chime in because, you know, expect uh, users would like to have that option as well. So it's, uh, you know, it has to be uh, in the frame of the, you know, the current software or maybe we need to think about future software, right? I mean, this is MCMC. Um, I guess in Sherpa we have that. It's just the way you uh, would define this correction is the, that's a question whether you want the spline or whatever. Because in the MCMC, uh, which um, Jeremy was doing for ARFs, at the end we had the PCA uh, coefficients to the standard ARF, which was given, right? So we had the standard ARF, which was generated for given data set observation source, right? And then you have this PCA components, which uh, allow you to vary the R. So there is something to think about, you know, how, you know, how to now make use of the uh, work which you've done and, you know, that people can use, right, more generally. Sorry, I have to run because another meeting. And yeah, few, I have another music. meeting as well. Yes. Uh, the question uh, I have for Herman and uh, uh, Jan Benet, are we meeting this week? Uh, this, oh, we're meeting next week. Uh, for Chask? Uh, we are, no, 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 not for Chask, for, for, for the for the Oh, uh, for, for the, for the paper. Uh, uh, if we are, uh, just let me know. I think I can make it. So Thursday at 10? 
Thursday, I, I have meetings today. Uh, this uh, for eleven. I I can do Thursday. Do ten is fine. Ten to eleven. I have to go by eleven. If you okay. if you want, because um, otherwise we meet next week. Yeah, I, Friday. I, Friday is fine. I I can't. I'm I'm like full up all all okay. week. I, I'm going to be. Uh, um, so 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 maybe we meet the next week. Yeah, next week yeah. works better for me. Actually. Yeah. Okay. Great. That's. Yeah, that's I've started implementing some of the changes that we talked about last. Yeah. Uh, great. Week. Yeah, we probably don't need to meet until we this change is made. Anyway. Uh, next Thursday there is a statistical maxims meeting. Uh, ten to eleven. Yeah. Then after maybe eleven, go on to. Okay. Whatever. Okay. Sounds good. All right. If that works for David. Sorry, I need to run. I need to get, right. grab something before. I... This is a good uh, time to. Yeah, this was great. Uh, yeah. Stop. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Very good. Thank you, guys. Thanks yeah. all. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.